up to now. Um, we are recording this webinar just as a heads up so that anybody who's unable to join can still get the information that we are sharing today. Um, so just something to note. Thank you so much for being here. And feel free to use the chat to say hello. Hi, Melanie. Welcome. Such an important thing to be an ambassador for. That's great. All right. Well, let's go ahead and get started. Hello, everybody. My name is Nova Getz. I am the Marketing and Communications Coordinator here at NAMI Metro Baltimore. Um, we like to put on these community conversations every a few months, every quarter, um, just to bring awareness to different mental health related topics. So the topic for this month is hoarding behavior. Um, and we really thought it was important to bring awareness to this topic because oftentimes it's a really misunderstood mental health condition. Um, so we just kind of wanted to break some myths and raise awareness about how people can get support if they need it or if they have a loved one who is living with this condition. So just to give you all a little bit of background on NAMI Metro Baltimore, um, we are the National Alliance on Mental Illness. We are the local Baltimore chapter. So we serve Baltimore City and Baltimore County with our free support groups, education programs, um, community presentations like this one. And we also go out into schools and do a ton of other stuff just to end stigma around mental health and really make sure that people can get the care that they need. So one in five people live with a mental health condition. We've seen that go up since um, the pandemic to about one in three. So, you know, it's just really important to get talking about mental health. Um, and I am joined here today with Jennifer Klingler, a clinical social worker who has personal experience working with people um, living with hoarding behavior and Mike Jackson and Chase Carroll um, from Puro Clean and Catrice, who is a NAMI Baltimore volunteer, and Ms. J, who's also a NAMI Baltimore volunteer. So together, we are going to share some information about this, some lived experiences. And without further ado, I'm going to pass it over to Mike to introduce who Pure Clean is real quick. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Michael Jackson, so we can get that out of the way. Um, I'm here with my colleague, Chase Cairo. Um, we're, with Pure Clean, we are an emergency restoration company, so we handle any property damage as it pertains to water, fire, a biohazard, backup, and mold, and more. Um, we're proud to sponsor today's NAMI Metro Baltimore um, community conversation. Uh, this topic is one that is near and dear to us, um, as our line of work has introduced us to many people and their loved ones who have experienced hoarding behavior right here in our community. Um, one of the ways that we've met uh, is that we offer CE, uh, which is continuing education courses to insurance agents and adjusters. Um, and we happened to offer a hoarding course um, about a year ago. And one of the agents was very intrigued by our delivery and the things that we were talking about and recommended that we establish a relationship with NAMI. So here we are today. Um, without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce all of you to Jennifer E. Klingler a licensed clinical social worker and psychotherapist in private practice in Baltimore. She is also a longtime NAMI member, a person living well with mental illness and has several family, several family members affected by mental illness and addiction. Jennifer, take us away. Thank you so much, I appreciate it. Um, so I really appreciate everyone having me here today. Thank you so much. Um, I'm coming at this from a clinical perspective, uh, just to give some information about hoarding um, and its prevalence and um, the treatment for it. So if I just can set up my sharing momentarily and we'll see if we have it right. Does that look right? Hold on, get out of there. Good, okay. Perfect. So, um, uh, you know, hoarding, um, we might think of it as just about the stuff, right? But we all have stuff. Um, we all have relationships with our stuff, right? So um, all of us keep things, acquire things, things that are useful, things that are sentimental. And uh, our relationship with our stuff and how much stuff we have is really on a spectrum, anywhere from somebody who's very minimalistic and does not tend to hold on to or acquire a lot of things, 
all the way to somebody who has maybe severe hoarding disorder and everything in between. So, you know, probably in some of our houses, we have like the Christmas tree, you know, the joke, like this is the where all the, the laundry piles up on one uh, thing or this other little cartoon that says, hmm, I better call you back. I'm not even sure he's if, if he's at his desk or not. So all of us have some degree of relationship with stuff and clutter. Hoarding, we're going to talk about the the where uh, our relationship with stuff becomes problematic, and that's with hoarding behaviors or hoarding disorder. So um, uh, there's this uh, lots of clinical um, uh, rating scales to help us decide how severe a person's problem is or how to identify what areas they need help with. And um, this is one of three clutter image rating scales uh, produced by uh, these researchers. And uh, I find it really interesting because it's a nice visual. We can uh, have family members or, or people with hoarding behaviors, you know, kind of point to an image to say, oh, my place is more like this and I'd like it to be more like this. Um, so on picture one, we have just like a normal kitchen, kind of very uncluttered, not much stuff in it. And this is a series of nine photographs. Um, in two and three, it's also a normal kitchen, you know, maybe it has some more stuff, some newspapers that maybe could go out for recycling, somebody left their shoes on the floor. Um, once we get though into pictures four, five, and six, we're starting to notice a problem here. So in picture five, we see that, you know, now nobody can sit at the table to eat their dinner. We'd have to move things from the stove in order to cook on it. Um, uh, and then once we get to, to seven, eight, nine, we start to see that this kitchen is, is not a usable kitchen um, and it could be hazardous, you know, the papers near the stove. Um, uh, once we get to uh, uh, the pictures eight and nine, we can't even notice that this is a kitchen. It, we wouldn't know by looking in through the doorway whether this was a kitchen or some other room. Um, so these researchers created these pictures to sort of give a visual reference of uh, what hoarding behavior could look like. Uh, sometimes people will think their problem is very small when in fact it's quite large. Um, and these images kind of put it on a scale. There's also a bedroom and a, I think a living room we'll look at later. Um, so really quickly, what is hoarding disorder? Um, it's now its own mental health diagnosis. Uh, it's related to OCD, but actually no longer thought of as a symptom of OCD, ranges in severity. Um, people with hoarding have difficulty with a couple of things, uh, difficulty discarding things. So things that we would normally get rid of when their usefulness is, uh, is done or when we no longer need or want them. They also often have difficulty with acquiring things. This might be lots of shopping, um, which could cause financial problems, or it could be acquiring like free stuff from the free cycle pages or, you know, uh, rescuing things from the dumpster uh, and bringing them home. Um, hoarding disorder causes distress, uh, clinically significant distress. Uh, impairment in different areas of a person's functioning and may cause safety problems. Uh, very often the living spaces cannot be used for their intended purpose, like we saw with that kitchen rating scale. Um, and as with several mental health conditions, um, hoarding is one where uh, a the person might have a limited amount of insight into that there is a problem or how severe the problem is. And we think that's actually a symptom of the brain illness that creates hoarding. Uh, it's not somebody trying to be difficult or, or uh, kind of denial as a defense mechanism. It's a real lack of awareness of, uh, of the problem. When, when we're talking about schizophrenia and in, in, uh, NAMI has a great post on this, um, we call this lack of insight, anisognosia, the lack of knowing oneself. Um, and this can also happen sometimes in people with hoarding disorder. Um, this is really common, affects about three or four out of every hundred people. So if you think about how many people are in your church or how many people are in your high school class or how many people are in the grocery store at every, every given time, um, three or four of those people 
uh, statistically might be dealing with hoarding disorder. So in Baltimore City alone, that's 20,000 people, um, let alone their spouses, children, family members, and communities that are affected. Um, Hoarding affects people of all demographic. There's no known differences in gender, in race, in socioeconomic status. Um, uh, sometimes it runs in families, very, very often. There's a first degree relative, a parent, a sibling, or a child who also has similar behaviors. Um, having a traumatic event or events in life can increase the risk, and it gets a little more likely as we age although it's not exclusively seen in the elderly. Um, and it often occurs along with illnesses like depression, ADHD, PTSD, OCD, um, or other mental health diagnoses. Um, here's what it's not. It's not OCD. Uh, we used to think it was a subset or a symptom of OCD. The difference is people with hoarding tend to get a lot of pleasure out of interacting with their um, belongings, their items, and a lot of, especially a lot of pleasure with acquiring, which is really different than OCD. They're related. So in, in the DSM, the big book of mental disorders, it's uh, um, under OCD and related disorders. So it is very closely related to OCD. And the people in the OCD, um, the International OCD Foundation have done a lot of work with hoarding uh, because of its close association. Um, it is not just a choice. Um, there are real brain differences uh, in people who have this versus people who don't. Um, it's not the person being lazy. It's not the person being dirty, although that can be a problem. And it's usually not as severe as you might see kind of sensationalized on TV shows like the the big hoarding clean out shows where, you know, uh, every, every, things are stacked up to the ceiling. Usually it's less severe than that. Those are the cases that get the public attention though, right? Um, so we think to ourselves like, why, if, I, if I'm a person with hoarding behaviors or if I have a family member, like, why am I saving this? Why are they acquiring this? Um, lots of reasons why. Um, so you might hear things like, I'm a collector, you know, these are my treasures. Um, they might uh, see things as being quite useful. I, I can't get rid of this jelly jar. I could use it to uh, put some soup in for my neighbor who might be sick and take her the soup. Well, the neighbor's not sick. You're not going to make the soup. You don't need the jelly jar. But people who have hoarding behaviors often see the possibilities in every item. Um, we might think, oh, you might hear, oh, it's valuable. This costs money. I can't let it go. Um, or it's very sentimental. Like this is the whole collection of the artwork that my children made like in K through 12. That would be a lot of material. Um, people with hoarding disorder are actually much more creative than people without. Um, so they see all the differences in shape and texture and color and variations. So there's a lot of saving that says, I could use this. I could use this for something else. I could make something out of this. I could fix it up and sell it. Um, but once it comes into the home, it sort of gets mixed in with all the other things and the project really never gets done. Um, there's a lot of uh, concern about being not being wasteful. Like I was raised during the depression. I was taught I can never waste anything or my family you know, didn't have a lot coming up and we saved everything we could. Um, or uh, people might feel really personally responsible for kind of the mass of garbage that the world creates and therefore they don't want to kind of add to that. So lots of like over responsibility thoughts. Um, and then the other one is like memories, right? So the things are not just things they are associated with the memories. I can't get rid of this slip of paper that I got in the restaurant that day when I met the person who was from France and I got their number because I wanted them to speak to my nephew who was learning for like, but, but it's just a little piece, piece of paper, but it has a whole story connected with it. And if we lost the paper, we might lose the memory or the, um, the event that went with it. Um, the hoarding is hard on folks. People with hoarding behaviors are not usually um, happy folks. Um, there are very, very high levels of anxiety, even if they're not willing to kind of share that or talk about it, um, such that even trying to dig into the problem could be really overwhelming. High rates of depression, 
um, strained family relationships oftentimes. Um, you know, their living condition, conditions might be less safe. So a pile could fall on somebody and hurt them. Or um, if there was a medical emergency, the EMS might not be able to get a stretcher in. Or if there was a fire, they might not be able to get out because all the exits are sort of blocked and you have to move something in order to get out of one. Um, I mentioned parts of the home can't be used for intended purpose, um, like the person's hygiene might be diminished because the shower and tub are now full of things, as well as the sink in the bathroom and most of the sink in the kitchen. Um, very often, uh, routine repairs to homes uh, and apartments are not done because the person doesn't want anybody to come in and see what's going on. So a toilet that might be running or not flushing turns into a massive problem where it didn't have to be, right? Um, or a leak in the roof that could have been fixed and, and the house in, you know, stays structurally sound might develop into a roof that caves in and causes water damage you know, all through the basement. And now the house is you know, not livable anymore. Um, so little things. Uh, often can't be addressed, so they turn into much bigger things. Um, and then people who have hoarding behaviors often have a lot of financial problems. Either they are spending their money on too much stuff, on too many storage units, or they simply uh, lose their bills and lose their turnoff notices. And uh, before you know it, um, you know, the, the bills have gone unpaid. Um, lots of effects on family and friends too. Um, children brought up in, in environments where hoarding is present can be really affected. You know, they can't have people over. They don't want people to find out what their home is like. Um, we might feel like um, our family member cares more about their possessions that they do about us, which is a misconception, uh, but often can be really hurtful, can feel really hurtful. Um, there can be lots of anger and resentment, especially if 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 we're trying to help our family member and they really don't want our our help. Um, uh, and then there, you know, the relationship can really be taken over by discussion about the hoarding, you know, trying to get them to change the hoarding. Uh, and then, you know, there's there's not room for other things. Um, a note about clean outs and calling the authorities. A lot of times family members will kind of uh, want to do this. Um, there are risks and benefits in doing that, um, and we'll talk a, a little bit more about those later. Um, for any clinicians that might be in the audience or family members or people with hoarding who just want to learn a little bit more about how we measure hoarding behavior, there's some clinical scales here. There was those visual rating scales, um, the saving inventory. Um, the structure, clinical in, in, structure and clinical uh, interview for mental disorders has a little module on hoarding. Um, the home's multidisciplinary uh, is actually really, one, it's like one or two pages, very easy to read and understand. Anybody can uh, administer it, it can be self-administered. All these can be found readily on the internet. Uh, and the saving cognitions inventory. So this is a bit more about how we think about our saving and acquiring. Um, so here's another clutter image rating scale. You can find these on the internet too. Before we saw the, the ones at the kitchen, this is a living room where it goes from very uncluttered kind of sparse all the way up to where you might not even be able to tell it's a living room. Um, we have a bedroom rating scale as well. These are not actual, um, you know, pictures of people homes with hoarding disorder these were created in a lab uh, to, to simulate what what we find the range of behaviors that we see um, so treatment uh, works uh, it's challenging though um, you know uh, the most effective treatment we have is cognitive behavioral therapy so this is learning about how people think about their acquiring and non-discarding and uh, that affects how they feel and how they behave and and their actions. So we try to to get in there and understand how people are thinking, see if we can uh, adapt that thinking to be a little more inclusive of other ideas. Like, yes, I want to keep all my stuff, and I also want to have my children and grandchildren over, you know, for Sunday dinner like we used to. So how can we kind of negotiate that? 
um, kind of challenging some of the assumptions. Like if I get rid of this piece of paper from the restaurant of the day I met the person, I can actually still remember that. I don't have to have the piece of paper, you know, to remember it. Um, or looking at like, what is the saving or, or acquiring? What are the other unintended effects that it's having? Um, very, very important. If there are co-occurring disorders, the, like trauma or attention problems, those really must be treated. We can't expect the person to be able to effectively uh, manage their hoarding or improve their hoarding without treating any additional behaviors that are going on. Um, if we're going to look at an intervention, we should look at a harm reduction model. So um, uh, if there's a pile that's, that's um, um, blocking the exit, maybe we should focus on that thing first, or if the toilet doesn't work, um, you know, that means the person doesn't have, uh, their place might be less sanitary because of that, or they might have complicated systems to get around it. We should maybe focus on that thing first. If the roof has caved in, right? Um, we don't need to work on this pile of papers over here. We need to, to deal with that first. Um, for, for places where there's not, uh, for situations where there's not maybe um, imminent harm going on, we can look at kind of uh, what we uh, also look at with substance use disorders and addictions is a stages of change model. So we look at where is the person in thinking about this problem? Do they not even consider it a problem? Um, if that's the case, we try to get them to think about if it's a problem. Um, if they're determined it's a problem, we try to move them over to, okay, what action are we willing to take? Um, and when we are taking action, we try to move into maintenance, like here are some systems we can use to keep this problem going. Um, you'll notice relapse is part of the process. Um, this is not linear. Most of the time people have fits and starts in terms of uh, changing their behaviors in anything we do, right? Um, so if I'm trying to go to the gym, I'll probably go like from January 1st to the 15th, and then I might not go as much. Um, the same is true when we're trying to change any behavior. Hoarding is no different. Um, sometimes medications are useful, but mostly uh, those are to treat co-occurring disorders. There is no FDA approved medication treatment that is just for hoarding. Um, and then support groups. Uh, I can't underestimate the importance or, uh, um, uh, what's the word? I can't, um, I, should, I should encourage people to look into support groups because they're tremendously effective for people to know they're not isolated, they're not alone. Um, there are other people like them struggling and the community support each other in ways that you know, a clinician or a family member might not be able to understand. So NAMI has general support groups. Um, there are support groups specific to hoarding behaviors, Clutter is anonymous, International OCD Foundation has support groups. Um, Buried in Treasures has uh, workshops and support groups uh, online in person. And uh, you'll also find a lot of information uh, or groups on various social media. So um, sometimes on uh, Facebook, I know there's a, a clutter support group where people kind of give each other support and encouragement, to try to keep each other accountable. Like, hey, I'm posting a picture in my kitchen now, you know, check back on me later today. I'm gonna, I'm gonna work on it. Um, uh, same with like Instagram and Snap, which can be, you know, great places to learn about for people who don't know, like learn about what it's like um, in there. Um, lots of great books on hoarding. I have some, have some visuals. So for people who have hoarding behaviors that are problematic, my favorite book is Buried in Treasures, um, Help for Compulsive Acquiring, Saving and Hoarding. It's like a it's uh, lots of information, but it's also like a workbook model. Um, really great if we can pair that with um, some clinical intervention. Um, for family members, different book. Uh, my favorite one for family members is called Digging Out, um, How to Help a Family Member, How to Help Your Loved One Manage Clutter, Hoarding, and Compulsive Acquiring. What I love about this book is that it helps families understand um, and acknowledge that it's okay to be upset and frustrated, um, you know, even sometimes angry, but that's not helpful. Uh, it won't help move the situation forward. Uh, and it teaches family members and loved ones about the risks and benefits of intervening. Um, and it also stresses the importance of continuing to have a relationship with our loved one who 
which doesn't involve their behavior. So we go to the ball game or we go out to dinner or we meet at the park and you see the grandkids and we don't talk about stuff all the time. Um, for general uh, information, uh, the book Stuff, um, these are, you notice some of the authors are overlapping. Um, this is a really fantastic read, it's very well written, has lots of um, vignettes uh, about real cases of people who have um, been in these studies and treatment um, and really shows you a range of behaviors for mental health professionals. There's a couple of other ones I don't have um, with me. Um, uh, really great one, treatments that work, uh, treatment for hoarding disorder has a clinician guide and a client uh, workbook as well. Um, lots of, so other resources, some jurisdictions have a hoarding task force, you may have heard about that. Um, I don't think we have one in Baltimore right now, although I understand that um, in the county it might be trying to reform, so these are Usually, um, you know, the Department of Mental Health, Department of Aging, you know, Protective Services, um, Fire Department, right, like getting together to figure out how to manage cases uh, of hoarding where the person might be at risk. Uh, mental health providers. So since this is a mental disorder, it's susceptible to treatment, it's covered by insurance, if you can have somebody uh, who specializes in this. Um, insurance does not usually pay for like the extra work of the clinician going to the home or spending very long sessions together. Um, and so that's uh, sometimes a little hard to find if you're relying on insurance. Um, there are professional organizers out there who can be really helpful combined with some clinical treatment. Um, uh, I'll say hoarding is not a uh, an organization problem solely. Um, it is a too much stuff problem. Oftentimes, people who uh, hoard think that uh, if I just had enough time to organize this stuff, right, it would just be, it, it would be okay. I just need to organize it better. Actually, it's too much stuff. Um, but there are um, uh, executive functions involving categorizing, organizing, prioritizing that are impaired in people who struggle with this. Um, there are um, some hoarding sensitive clean out intervention companies. So our, our friends are joining us today from PuroClean, and I very much appreciate them being here. Um, I like also Address Our Mess, um, Transitions Moving Services, there's also SteriClean, ServePro, I haven't worked with them um, personally. So um, the thing about the cleanouts, right? Um, uh, if the person is still going to be like living in that space, a clean out alone won't solve the problem. Um, you know, how could it possibly get back to the way it was before? It'll get back to the way it was before if there's no treatment. Um, just like if we cleaned out a wound but never did anything to bandage it up or or kill the germs, you know, it would it would come it would come back. It would not heal. Um, so um, these. Uh, companies I find are most helpful when things have either come to a crisis point, um, there's been uh, a hoarding problem combined with like plus some kind of disaster. So the most recent um, uh, case I was working on which this happened is the person were, and I were working together on the hoarding. And then when we had that cold snap in December, they had a pipe burst in their basement apartment and everything on the first 18 inches was ruined and then got moldy. Um, so it became an emergency where we had to have people come in and help sort through, uh, discard things, um, you know, um, move things to storage, pick out what's useful. And now we're trying to, in an organized way, move back in. Um, there are a couple of websites out there, hoarders.com, hoardingcleanup.com. They have support groups on the web sites, they have clinical information kind of on the websites. Just keep in mind, these are run by um, clean out companies. So they're, they might be skewed towards uh, that sort of intervention, uh, just so you know. Um, but although they people do find the support groups and other things helpful. Uh, so takeaways, it's a real mental health diagnosis. It's not just a choice or a made up or you know a quirk about someone's behavior. Um, people uh, who struggle with severe hoarding really don't have a lot of choice over, over 
what they're doing. They're not doing it on purpose and they really have a hard time changing. They need help. Um, it affects the family, it affects the community. It is very common. You're definitely not alone. Um, and uh, sometimes the big interventions are necessary, sometimes can cause more harm than good. So we've got to really weigh that out. Um, treatment can be effective, usually involves like a psychiatrist, a therapist, a family member, a friend that can help with this, a community, a support group, um, helping all creating a nest of support around the person we're hoarding so they can change their behaviors. Um, uh, and uh, thank you. So that's that's all from me. Thank you so much for listening to my TED talk. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jen. That was such an enlightening presentation that you just gave, and I think really gave a, a great amount of insight into all of the different factors that sort of play into why somebody might develop hoarding behavior. Um, and, and yeah, that leads us right into our panel discussion. So I'm going to invite Catrice and Jay to come and speak with us. Um, and of course, Mike and Jen, if you have, and Chase as well, if you have any insights that you want to share during this part of our conversation, um, feel free to jump in. So just to kick us off, let's do a little round robin. Um, can you all please just say your names, what you like to do for fun, and briefly share what your relationship is with hoarding. So I'm going to start with um, Ms. J. Oh, you're muted. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ms. J, and I'm with NAMI. Um, I am a facilitator and a trainer. Um, someone with mental illness lived experience also. Um, I enjoy traveling. I'm a foodie connoisseur um, all around. Uh, I enjoy crafting and my relationship with hoarding is I have two aunts on my mother's side and my father's side. Thank you. And yeah. Katrice. Uh, hi everyone. Good to meet you. My name is Catrice. I am a Baltimorean. I am a volunteer with NAMI. Um, my relationship to hoarding, which would be, I'm a person who has managed it um, and come through it. I wouldn't just say hoarding for me, I would say clutter more so uh, towards hoarding, uh, but not, I, I'll explain that if I have a chance, because some of these, uh, yeah. So, uh, and what I'd like to do for fun is um, I'm an Anglophile, so I really love binge watching um, UK television, mainly police procedurals, mysteries, and UK dramas. If it's on, if it's if it's a certain program, I'm I'm in for twelve episodes, one after the other. It's just a lot of fun. Good to meet everyone. That's awesome. I wonder if you're a fan of the British baking show because that's my favorite, but. <laughs> um, yes. Such <laughs> <laughs> a good time. Cool. And Chase. Oh, you're muted, my dear. Sorry about that. Hi, everyone. My name is Chase Cairo. I work uh, at Pure Clean. Uh, thanks for having me today. Uh, I played small division three football and studied psychology at a small D3 school in Ohio. Uh, but I've been working for house restoration, uh, you know, since I was little. Uh, my experience with hoarding is I've helped service the cleanouts and, you know, work closely with the family uh, and kind of help them through the whole process. And I've done quite a few of the, the jobs. So thanks for having me. Thank you for being here. And Mike. Well, you already heard from me, um, but I'm Mike Jackson. Um, I'm a former football player and, and track athlete myself. Um, I worked in education for 18 years as a coach um, and, um, you know, in terms of the hoarding and we, you know, I'm, I'm the person who builds relationships um, with all of you, with insurance agents, adjusters, all that stuff. Um, one cool highlight for me um, is that I am going to be inducted into the Hall of Fame um, for the first college that I worked at uh, for 11 years. So super excited about that. But Glad to be here with all of you and uh, getting to hear your stories. Congratulations. That's awesome. Wow. 
So, so we've got some awesome people on this panel. Um, let's dive right into the conversation. So Catrice, thank you again for being here and for being willing to share your experience with clutter and hoarding. Um, as somebody who's, you know, sort of witnessed it firsthand, both in your job, going into other people's homes and sort of seeing it and having that personal experience, um, some people might sort of misinterpret they they might think it's just a mess but more often than not there are other obstacles that are emotional and physical that can prevent you know the mess from being cleaned up could you could you share some things that you wish people understood a little bit better about hoarding sure um so we just saw the hoarding clutter scale we know what it all looks like when we see it right um at its beginnings at its worst and uh, the people I, at one time, one of the jobs that I used to have uh, was mail carrier. So I met a lot of Baltimoreans in many different areas, uh, not just one station area, but many. Uh, so what I found was, to be honest, <laughs> for me and my experience, they were some of the kindest people. Um, and when I say that, I mean they were the people that offered me something to drink every day. They were the people that opened the door that wanted to check on me to make sure that I was okay. What, uh, they came to the door often. They'd open the door and then after time, because I was almost there for 16 years uh, in terms of that work, um, I developed a lot of trust with people. So over time, you know, um, people would open their door more than a crack and even wider. Uh, I think that happens when you're not shaming people and they feel like a whole person. Um, I'll just say this in that I felt like despite the conditions of where they may live or even the emotional um, upheaval inside that I can't see or couldn't see, they had a lot of love to give and it was the tsunami of love that they wish they were receiving and the same amount of acceptance. I think there's something to be said about that. Um, kindness is different than love. It's a component, but they're not the same thing. Uh, love is connection. It is support. It is integrating with people. So I found in my travels that people needed more. They needed real time connection. They needed something to rely upon. I think they were very open to me because I was literally a fixture every day at the same time for years. I was the thing that never changed until it did, until I had to leave or go to another station. It was something they could depend on that was good. Um, that being said, I, I, I have loved ones that have had the same experiences, have had issues with hoarding, not a many, but uh, I know a, a couple of people. And usually it was something in their lives that was a precipitating factor for them. Uh, and I'll just switch to myself because uh, as a matter of fact, it's interesting we're having a discussion uh, earlier about OCD because I actually do have OCD. Um, so um, there's, there's no way, one way to look at everything, even though I understand what the medical professionals are saying. What I'm saying is that there's an overlay of many things a lot of times and a lot of gray areas that all crisscross together. So it is really hard to see it very clearly unless people are in relationship with their therapist over time to figure out what's what and to tease it all out. And in my experience, in my life, that that was a significant difference um and again the same thing you know uh trust relationship and people actually interacting um kindness wasn't enough and it it wasn't appropriate um so for me i was a, an assault survivor um i actually was extremely meticulous uh for many many years uh didn't have a problem in that regard. And, but I did have issues with OCD for a long, long time. I didn't have hoarding or clutter issues. Um, unfortunately, the rigors of OCD and the type 
groups that I presented with took up an awful lot of my time. Uh, so that wasn't the issue for many years. What was the precipitating issue was intimate partner violence uh, and not having social support and trying to come to grips with my own mortality by myself and trying to come to grips with shame and being shamed at the same time for really something that did not belong to me. It was something that happened to me. Um, the other piece is uh, because of the intimate partner violence, I experienced a concussion. I, um, I, I don't want to be very specific, but I did sustain a significant um, injury to the head. And so therefore um, there was executive function issues, but I didn't know that because normally, you know, the procedure with concussions is there's some time and they're for like over time, number of months, you'll be okay. You know, it's expected to have some issues early on, but uh, I, I, I wasn't reading very well at first and various things were happening. Um, I lost the ability over time, it would go in and out. And then of course, with depression and PTSD because of those things, I lost the ability to see things clearly. Um, and with dissociation happening at the same time, everything would go in a fog. I'd miss, um, I'd miss that I'm not myself, that I'm not doing all my things. And it would just kind of, I just couldn't see all of that. Um, and you are holding on um, to some degree to your past life, the life that was before the, for, before the rug was pulled out from under you. Um, now with me, and I can only speak about me because everyone's different. For me, unfortunately, my OCD was intruding so uh, and combining with what was going on. So when things were all down and let's say I, after that precipitating incident, a number of things happened such as vandalism. And then I was stalked for three years by that same person. So it was a lot of vandalism for three years after that. Um, significantly something happened with my oil tank and I, uh, there was a, due to the vandalism, uh, directly, and it created a, uh, forget what people call it, uh, a puff back, small puff back, which basically, it's a little explosion in your house. <laughs> uh, the fire came out of the, uh, the uh, furnace, and I needed to dive under the flames in order to hit the button so it would stop feeding it, and the um, Chimney sweeps let me know that it was because someone had poured a solvent into my oil tank. Um, there was nothing I could do about that. So when I say I was really grappling with understanding my mortality, being harmed six months earlier, and then this, and then every few months, another thing. Uh, it, it, it was just taking me out of my ability to function normally. Um, but also that's when people like, for instance, these two gentlemen here, their type of companies, the insurance company brought people in, but in that to help clean the soot off the walls and every knickknack in my house, uh, it was an enormous um, and expensive amount of damage. Um, but unfortunately within that six month period of time from the initial harm to the then the puff back, I had devolved so much and was no longer myself. Everything was everywhere. I was a completely different person than I was a year earlier or my whole life before. Um, so it was very humiliating to have to let people into your home and you cannot, you're not yourself. What my home looked like by that time was about maybe a four or five on that scale. Uh, and then it would, then I was able to write things. And then I kept going back and forth between three, four, 
tipping to five and then I'd go, then I'd figure out how to come back and be present and wipe it all away. And then vacillating between three and four. Um, in my mind, because there were constant attempts to stalk and harass and break in, in my mind, I kept thinking that if I just leave everything where it is, that nothing important could possibly be found or stolen. Um, and that I would be safe from harm, even if it is uncomfortable for me to be in a situation that is egotistonic, something that I really, that is not comfortable for me. It's not me. It's not working well for my mental health. Um, of course, that is not, that does not make sense. I know that, but that is where I was at the time. Now, since that time, just to wrap it up, um, uh, I, I eventually, uh, you know, sustained because of those assaults I, and another a car accident later, I had to go to the Sinai Brain Injury Program and was admitted for that. Um, and yes, it is executive function for me issues, but also the mental health pieces, PTSD, the social disorder, depression. Um, and then when I was able to do things better on my own, um, since that time, the barriers would be affordability to be able, because there's these wonderful companies out there, but I couldn't always afford it. Um, I had become disabled, so I couldn't pick up tubs of things and take them to goodwill. So they're just, they were piled up. Um, and then I had to wait until I could get the help. Some people may ask about friends and family. Um, some people have wonderful support and they'll be able to tell their own stories why they did not accept that support. For my life, I had people who might offer, but then they were people that I never, I love them very much. And I knew that they may have some level of care for me, but that did not necessarily mean that I was emotionally safe with them. So I may hear something like, uh, I tell them, that, you know, what I'm going through and they may say, well, you know, it's not of God for you to be like this. Well, I, I'm going to be very frank here. I'm not letting people like that in my house. I am a Christian, but I am apps and I'm already going through what I'm going through. I'm not letting someone stop on my, my well-being and my, my spirit just in order to get help. Um, some people say, well, put your pride aside. It isn't pride, it's well-being. And I had just learned the hard way that um, I was worth more than trading my well-being just to get help in the interim and then be broken apart. So there were people that were able to be safe. I do want to switch to that. And um, not a lot. But I'm so grateful for the people who were able to help me with little things. I may call and say, can you help me drive to such and such? I just want to go to this drop off. Can you help me? Um, the people who could do that and had the time to do it, the resources like a car that I did not have, the energy for it, the energy to not be judgmental. And even if they had those thoughts to suppress them. Um, I am grateful for that. So I've, I've talked a bit, but I want to defer to the rest of the panel, but that's a significant part of my story. And um, there are so many points that Jennifer brought up earlier, like possibilities. I still work with, with thoughts like that. And that's, for me, that's CBT work. Mm -hmm. um, and I do that constantly. I have a wonderful bottle collection that I don't need. Now, does my house look like a three or four? No, not anymore. I'm not there anymore, but I still do have to do work because I'm still healing on the inside. Um, but my God, I've come a long way and I'm so happy to tell you that. Mm -hmm. And thank you for everybody who's out there helping other people. Um, without judgment, you're doing great work and I wish you well. Thank you, Catrice. Thank you so much for your vulnerability and, and your openness with your story. Um, I think you raised so many important points just about how while hoarding might be something somebody can see, 
there's so much under the surface, right? And that you don't know what a person has necessarily been through that's brought them to this point. Um, so thank you for, for, for bringing attention to that and for being here today. Ms. J, do you want to share a little bit about your relationship with hoarding and, and your aunts? Yes, thank you. Um, my story, um, sometimes you have to take a step back at self-reflection um, because as Jennifer stated that it can be hereditary. Um, and I'll dive into that part. But with my aunt, um, she had trauma throughout her childhood. Um, she's in her mid sixties now. So it's been an uphill battle. Um, it impacts someone day to day with severe clutter, um, health and safety, um, in the home, uh, emotionally devastating, uh, because it can cause eviction, homelessness, um, water damage. Um, we've had severe mold and this is our family home. Um, so my grandfather and grandmother's home. So it's severe mold over several times throughout the year. Uh, the roof is came, came crashing in. Um, so we had roof damage. Um, all the family photos um, from way back are forever gone. Um, memories that you can't get back. And um, conflict with family members and friends who are frustrated and concerned of the state of the home and the people inside the home. Um, and it's unconditional support in which the hoarder feels abandonment. So within that abandonment, they turn to their stuff. So the person that is the family member or the friend, to them, it's stuff. But to the hoarder, it's collective valuables. And what do you do? You talk to them and it's, and it's do's and don'ts with hoarding. You do not touch their items. You have to watch the language talking to them. You can't talk at them. You have to talk to them because you're saying it's junk, but to them, that jelly jar is worth a million dollars. To the neighbor, as Jennifer said, to give some soup to, that's important to them. What do you do when you suggest to go to see a doctor or a counselor? They don't want to listen. What can you do but be supportive and know your boundaries? You have to learn boundaries with someone who is a hoarder because you can get so involved and so engulfed in their world that it consumes you. So now you're angry, which means you're taking it out on people who don't deserve it because you're frustrated at the person that you care more about that you feel they don't care about themselves. And they don't like to hear the word, the word stuff. It's not stuff. When you attach yourself to items, it's trauma. The trauma is what you have to get to of why they have developed into the situation that they're in currently. But you have to go so far back that they're not willing or able and capable of going that far back because it can be sexual assault. It can be mental illness. 
it can be substance abuse. It can be a lot of things, but everyone is not open and willing to share that journey of hoarding. And again, thank you, the death of a loved one. So with my aunt, there were several members of that household who passed away. So now she's totally alone in this house where there's five family members who passed away. So she feels totally isolated and detached because she stays in the past a lot. So when you're staying in the past, 30 years ago, 30 years ago, it's hard to even move forward from 30 years ago to 2023. So the best advice that I can give is be a listening ear, suggest support groups, don't push, don't touch the items, work with them, suggest helping them, but suggest in a calm manner. Because when you go in and you're agitated, they're gonna take that with their hands up. And then you're gonna see a different side of this person as though they're not being cooperative because they're feeling attacked. And what does a person do who feels attacked? They shut down. And then they don't wanna have anything to do with what you're saying, they're tuning you out. And that's what you don't want. You wanna to get to the root of the hoarding, which is gonna take time and patience. And again, boundaries. Boundaries is everything when it comes to someone with an addiction because of you getting so enthralled in their world. And that's my Thank portion. Thank you, Ms. J. Um, I think you, you also raised a lot of important points just about how you know, remembering that it is a sensitive issue as a family member and, you know, the way that you approach talking about it, um, it's, it's, you have to remember that they're a whole person, right? It's not just the mess that you see, but like Jen was saying before too, like it's going to the ball game, it's inviting them to dinner. It's just making sure that they feel that connection with others still, um, you know, because there, there may be that sense of shame that they can't let people in. So invite them out, you know, and, and take care of them that way too. Mm -hmm. Um, Let's pivot over to talking about um, any kind of like interventions. Jen, um, is it typical to do an intervention as a family member? How does that usually look to get that ball rolling? Um, so uh, what I recommend is people educate themselves about the symptoms of hoarding um, first. Um, and this is what I would recommend when any family is thinking about having an intervention for any other thing, whether it's, you know, bipolar or schizophrenia or trauma or OCD or um, please, you know, educate yourselves first. There's plenty of good resources out there. What you see as um, our panelists have described so eloquently, uh, Catrice and Ms. J, what you see is not the problem it's a symptom of the problem um, and symptoms sometimes do have to be managed for safety reasons um, uh, but if we don't get at the underlying problem we're not going to get anywhere um, i really uh, appreciate uh, catrice talking about uh, like her she, she had some knowledge that the way she had her life set up was not exactly healthy, but it felt necessary to protect her at the time. Um, and uh, if if we go in and try to intervene with that and say, this stuff is a problem, it's making you less safe, that really wouldn't work, right? Because she was not in that space. Um, or uh, Miss J talking so uh, compassionately about your aunt, you know, recognizing that she's all alone in there. Um, and uh that the you know she's isolated 
she has like these things that she's holding on to as treasures, but uh, doesn't have like she has attachments to those instead of attachments to people because the people in her life have have, you know, she's lost so many of them. Um, so it's so important for us to understand if we go in there and talk about, look, dad, this is a mess. You can't live like this anymore. You know, there's there's mice, there's roaches, there's rotten food, there's trash. Why are you keeping this? Why are you keeping this? This doesn't make any sense. It, it, you will the person will shut the door on you and they will uninvite you from their life. Um, that's not the goal when people are family members are trying to help. It's because they love and care about the person. Um, it always comes from a place of love and care and support, um, or it should. <laughs> um, uh, but if we're trying to control the person in their life choices, it's not going to work. We have to invite them to come on this journey with us. Um, sometimes there are obvious safety things that we can get the person to agree on and we can deal with those. Or sometimes there are easy categories um, that we can deal with, right? Um, and so that, those places might be places to start. So, um, um, uh, family photos, if there are any, or uh, newspapers, right? So we may be able to convince somebody to reduce their collection of newspapers to the ones that are not damaged. And that means boxes and boxes of newspapers can leave the home, or we can convince them that we can release these newspapers back out into the universe recycle them, they won't go to waste, they will turn into other paper products that other people around the world might need. Um, and so that might be a way to help them let go. And then once you have a way in, right, sort of just expanding that a little bit, always being a good listener, always being respectful. Um, I uh, go to people's homes all the time as part of my work. I can't imagine doing my work and not being able to be with the person in their home. And I always ask, is it okay if I touch this? Do you mind if I move this a little over? Um, is it okay if we pick this up and take a look at it? Um, because it would be a it would be a violation to not do that. When you see it from the outside though, and you're not taking into account what has gone into this, what has gotten the person to this point, it can be, I wanna make sure family members to hear me that I understand why you're frustrated and why um, you're desperate for help and why it might come off as like anger. Um, I, I get that. It's totally reasonable reaction to have. It's just not going to be helpful. So you're going to have to find a way to deal with that yourself in order to be helpful to your family member, your loved one. Thank you. Um, real quick, uh, I just want to give Chase a second to sort of talk about his experience kind of going in um, and, and how, you know, Pure Clean kind of navigates these sensitive sort of situations. And then we'll open it up for Q&A. Thank you. So for me, I'm usually brought in um, when a family member or a loved one or a friend uh, has identified the need for, you know, some further intervention. And when that occurs, there's usually, you know, some clinical work that's being done on the side. And a big thing for me and a part I want to touch on is the, the language piece and asking and how you present yourself when going through people's stuff. And then also just creating a customized plan for the person. I'm a very process and process oriented person. So I try to, you know, boil it down to do the same thing on every job. But in these wording situations, it's very important that you customize it uh, for the person, uh, just whatever that means. So you know, whether they're gonna be on site to help you go through those things, or if a loved one's gonna be the decision maker, uh, you know, talking through with all the appropriate parties on what, how, what is the best way to proceed for this uh, customer, this, you know, this person that's being affected. That is so important just because everybody's different. You don't know their story. And so you want to be as respectful as possible and really just make sure that they know um, that you care. Kachis, I see you have your hand up. Um, I'm so appreciative you said that, Chase. I really am because I know when I needed to let some people in um, for the, the restoration crew after the puffback, um, and Jay, I'm glad you brought up, uh, I have multiple things going on in my head, so bear with me. Jay, I'm glad you brought up uh, grieving because the year before that happened to me, my nephew of six weeks who was coming to live with me 
died at six mm. weeks. And then uh, four months later, my dad died. Um, and then the following year, my best friend died and then I was harmed. So it was a cacophony of things. I'm glad you, you touched on grief. It matters and respect. Chase, in terms of the language, when the restoration crew came in, I'm so glad you brought this up because some of the cleaning team who had come in, I could hear them talking like when they were in my bathroom. They were kind to me, but I was talking when they were in my bathroom. Now this particular cleaning team from this particular crew, uh, it, it, was a, a, it was a real service, a restoration service. They, they had some opinions about my bathroom. They thought I couldn't hear because they were speaking in Spanish, but I also speak multiple languages and I understood what they were saying and they would not have known that, you know, mm -hmm what my abilities were. But what I did decide to do was talk to them and let them know, one, that I could hear them and, and I'm in my own home. And two, um, explain a little bit, because I could hear them as you were speaking, they were saying, it's disgusting, it's disgusting. And then I was evil. Um, so I needed to use my faculties to address that. Um, not in a mean manner. I really at the time didn't have the energy or strength for that, to be honest. Um, and they did respond well, and they heard me. The fact that they chose to hear me um, meant a lot to me. And their response was, um, they continued doing their excellent job they were already doing, but they were extremely kind to me after that. And to be honest, I really needed that gentleness uh, not to word, use the word kind, but that gentleness and that connection and that that intention, that good intention in my home, mm -hmm. um, that made a difference. Uh, that people understood that they weren't just coming in doing a job. They were. It, 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 this was a healing space for me, and it's important to have that intention coming in my home. Um, so I wanted to to. Uh, say something about that and tell you, Chase, I have so much respect for you that you even have that intention going into people's homes. Um, mm -hmm. It does matter and um, I'm grateful you have it. Thank you. Thank you and thank you for sharing. Thank you. So let's open up the floor. Um, I saw we got a question in the chat and if anybody else has other questions, please use the Q&A box. Uh, we have about seven, eight minutes for Q&A. So somebody asked a question, what do you do if you have a family member who is living in your own home? I think it was a teenager, if I'm not mistaken. Um, yes, what, what do you do if they are living in your own home and living with hoarding behavior? Um, so I would say um, the, the research shows that when the person with the clutter or hoarding issues is living with someone else, there can be a tendency to sort of counterbalance some of the saving and hoarding or some of the um, sort of downstream effects. So it's okay to have boundaries in your own home about especially the common living areas of the house. Um, it's uh, all the things though that we mentioned about trying to understand the um, factors that went into developing this behavior, um, making sure that we um, that we try to treat those underlying things, making sure that we work with the person on what they want, right? So trying to get them to the next stage of change to accept more help, um, and that we um, you know don't permit unsafe situations in our in our own home. So this would apply for other kinds of problems as well. So if we had a person with substance use in our family, we might also have some boundaries or rules about that no substances in the house, um, you know, no, no dangerous things or situations or people. Um, uh, but the, it's hard when it's our ch child, because we are used to being in charge of their life. So we had to clean their room. Um, we had to keep their bodies clean. We had to clean their clothes. And now they're a young adult, but they're still in our house. And there's still some parent-child dynamic. Um, so uh, try to uh, continue to have respect, open dialogue. Don't make all the relationship about the stuff. Um, keep that connection there. Um, but it's OK to have some boundaries and get some help for yourself about this. It's, it's terribly difficult to live with. 
Can I piggyback off of that, Jennifer? Of course. Um, when you have a teenager, the first thing you need to start looking at is when they start hiding things. Hiding things under the mattress, hiding things under the bed, hiding things um, in the closet, because that stuff builds and builds and builds and builds. And those are the first signs that you're, you will start to see um, for potential hoarding. Thanks, Ms. J. Any other questions? Um, we are open books. So if we have any other questions or do any panelists want to sort of share any other things that maybe we got we missed? I just want to say that um, you know, with all of the people that you're seeing on the on the panel, there's been some questions about, you know, hey, who do I talk to? This is just a huge partnership here. So use who, whoever you're seeing here and com communicate with them if you feel like they might be the best fit to start with. Um, and then, you know, we're all in constant communication, whether we're meeting today uh, or we've already, you know, been working together. And so, um, you know, don't be afraid to reach out to any of us. Um, and just like I said, when I first started, I believe I said it, is that, you know, if, we're, if we are not the people that can help you specifically uh, in that moment, uh, we know someone who can. Awesome. Thanks, Mike. Um, so we got another question. My 21 year old daughter who lives at home has a problem with impulsive shopping and hoarding clothes. She does not wash her clothes. She just continues to buy more and more. I have large trash bags of her clothes in my basement and she keeps clothes all over her bed and on her bedroom floor to the point where she can't sleep in the bed. What resources can I seek out to help her and me? I am really at my wit's end and I really need help for her. Um, hoarding can be related to difficult experiences and painful feelings. So you might find it hard, they might be hard for them to express um, a way to resolve. Hoarding helps them cope with mental health problems, um, distracts them from feeling anxious, upset, or afraid of something that's going on with them. So having a support group um, like NAMI um, appear uh, someone in their age um, group that uh, is a little well-versed and that you can bring them on to help in the situation. If you don't feel comfortable as the mother talking to them, um, there's some, there might be a cousin that they can come and help with that they can be in tune with because trying to talk to your parent about what's going on is not always um, an open door so that's such a good point sometimes you know we, we've been talking so much about youth and peer support lately here at NAMI and really it, it can be such a valuable outlet to just talk to somebody who's your age who maybe is going through something similar that you don't feel like you can bring up with with you know a parent or, or somebody who is your guardian you know who who sort of has their own perspectives about you uh Jen I think you might have wanted to chime in too uh, so I'd say making sure we get a full and comprehensive evaluation uh, so we can make sure there's, see if there's any co-occurring disorders. Has there been trauma? Is there anxiety? Is there OCD? You know, are there contamination fears? We just, we, we don't know what, so I would want to talk to the person and say, what's behind this behavior? What's going on with you? Maybe they get a huge amount of pleasure from buying the clothes and they, and they can't get in touch with that pleasure in other ways. Maybe they feel um, like once something is touched and used, it's contaminated and then they don't want to use it or wash it again. Um, and we can help with that. There, there's help for that. Um, so I'd want to know kind of what's behind the behavior with the daughter. And also, you know, get so getting really important, getting treatment for that. And then also just sort of also you know, natural consequences can help also contain the behavior. So, you know, uh, I don't know how your 21 is affording all the clothes, right? But that might be something uh, to look into. Or after the dirty clothes end up in the thing in the basement, you know, there might be a family rule that there can only be three extra bags in the basement. So what do you want to do with them? Um, uh, it, it, 
it is really challenging to live with these behaviors in, in the home. If, if it's just something that's recently developed, though, I would really want to understand, make sure we're not missing a piece of what's going on. If you've seen this all our life from childhood, it could be sort of a more um, organic hoarding disorder that doesn't have you know trauma or other things involved, in which case um, the, uh, the good treatment and interventions about cognitive behavioral therapy, um, you know, moving her from a state of change, like, does she not care about this problem? Can we make her care about it a little bit? Can we get her some help? Can uh, we help her feel good about it? That sort of thing. Wonderful. Thank you so much. I am mindful of the time. Um, we are <laughs> close to wrapping up. So I just want to take a second to say thank you to all of our panelists. Um, for each, you know, bringing your wealth of knowledge from your lived experiences to what you do out in the world to try to help people. Um, all of you really, really helped today. And I'm, I'm really grateful. And thank you all for being so supportive in the chat and for listening today. Um, we will keep in touch. I'll send an email after this. Um, panelists, please feel free to share any information with me and I can share that back out um, and, and please do keep in touch with us. NAMI Metro Baltimore is around, so is Puro Clean, so is Jen. So we are happy to help however we can. Um, and thank you and I hope you all have a good afternoon. Thank you. Thanks to thank everybody. You, everyone. Thank you. Have a good afternoon. Take care. Take care. Bye-bye.